It's a, a great honor to be asked to, to give this lecture, the Fischelson Lecture. Uh, I did not know him, um, but I would like to honor him. And the best way that I can do that is to uh, present a talk which essentially I have never given before. I've been thinking about this for some time, uh, but this was an opportunity for me to try to put put the pieces together. Uh, and it's about, as you can see, the design of, of financial systems. The subtitle is revealing uh, first principles as a foundation for policy. So let me show you something I found in uh, Badgett, who wrote a famous book called Lombard Street about the money market in England. Uh, the context of this was something called Peel's Act, uh, which was some time ago. But the essence of it is that the uh, creation of the central bank, essentially, uh, and giving them a monopoly on the issue of currency, outlawing all privately issued notes. Uh, or at least they had to be 100% backed by, by gold. Um, and, and what Badgett says over here in the preference to his very famous book, uh, but in the ensuing pages, I mean to speak as little as I can of the Act of 1844. And when I do speak of it, I shall deal nearly exclusively with its experienced effect, and scarcely at all, if at all, with its refined basis. For this I have several reasons. One, that if you say anything at all about the Act of 1844, it is little matter what else you say, for few will attend to it. Most critics will seize on the passage uh, as to the Act, either to attack it or to defend it, as if that were the main point. There has been so much fierce controversy as to this act of parliament, and there is still so much animosity that a single sentence respecting it is far more interesting to very many than a whole book on any other part of the subject. Um, so, um, so I'm going to take you through some countries just to give you the context. This is the US. Uh, and I'm clearly influenced by what happened in the financial crisis in the US, the details of what happened, and policy uh, geared toward trying to prevent another one. And you can see from uh, this schemata uh, the rise of the so-called shadow banking sector, uh, which was mediating uh, these uh, mortgage-backed securities and a uh, very famous report from Squam Lake uh, uh, trying to get at a diagnosis of the financial crisis. Uh, not everyone is in agreement, of course. You've got uh, Ken Rogoff and his co-author Reinhardt basically saying the U.S. thinks it's unique, but actually it isn't. And these kinds of financial crises give rise to repression and likens the U.S., if not Europe, to uh, the experience of developing countries. Uh, and there's also a monetary side to this uh, although this may not be the best reference because there was an enormous intervention by the central bank uh, in unconventional monetary policy. Uh, and I'm going to do exactly what Badgett told me not to do, uh, which is to say, you know, nowadays people talk about Main Street versus Wall Street and uh, from both parties. Uh, trying to appeal to that segment of the electorate. Uh, and the idea, I think, is that something is fundamentally different, that Wall Street is big banks and high finance and very self-serving, and that somehow we have the common man uh, in Main Street sort of totally disconnected from the financial system. So when I attempt in these pages to analyze the financial system from first principles, uh, I will be talking both about Main Street and Wall Street and trying to put them uh, on the same page or analyze them the same way. Now, of course, it's not just the US. So in a way, I mitigate the criticism by 
focusing as well on other countries. These two uh, I have something to do with. Thailand, as was mentioned, uh, is a place where I've been gathering data for many years. They had, they originated the 1997 financial crisis uh, uh, that spread to the rest of Asia. They adopted, R Rogoff would say, repressionary policies and, uh, and have these very scripted financial sector plans outlining, in their view, what, what role various institutions and actors ought to have in the financial system. Meanwhile, of course, the country grows and develops, and, uh, and there are complaints from the Asian Development Bank, for example, uh, that the country is missing innovations in microfinance and e-money, and, uh, and, uh, and they do have markets, bond markets, but essentially almost nothing happens in those bond markets. So I guess the point is they had a financial crisis uh, quite some time ago, and they're still living policy-wise with the repercussions of, of how they dealt with it, uh, in some sense repressing the financial system. Now China, a place that I'll visit uh, later this week, uh, faces a conundrum or a lack of a framework between micro and, and macro. It, here I just have this quote from Bloomberg, China's leaders shift from short-term stimulus to five-year plan. And the joke would be that was October 25th. On October 26th, the title was China's leaders shift from five-year plan to short-term stimulus. Uh, and so on it goes, really, without a whole lot of guidance. But some innovation definitely happening. So they have not had this financial crisis, but they are, and the world is very, very worried about uh, about that possibility. So uh, then the point is to ignore the context of individual countries, really, and just start over. Okay, so how do we start over? Well, the first is measurement. We have to measure and map the, finance, the financial system because we need to know what's out there. We don't want to conjure up some story that's not based on reality. We can do this from existing data, although there are often shortfalls, so some guidance about uh, future data. Um, now, what do I mean by mapping the financial system? Well, basically, you start with financial accounts. So these accounts I created with my co-author, Chris, uh, based on corporate financial accounting. So these households, many of which are running businesses, uh, are mapped by us into this uh, corporate financial account setting, and we have the income statement, the balance sheet, and the statement of cash flow. We think that it's really necessary to have all three uh, sets of financial accounts because we want to distinguish, for example, liquidity from productivity, hence cash flow as opposed to accrued income, and also not just static balance sheet at a point in time, but but wealth accumulation. Now, where do these accounts come from? Well, they come from detailed individual measurement of transactions. All these accounts are transaction-based. Uh, it can get complicated. You have to make decisions about where to put the numbers. Typically, with uh, these financial accounts, the number almost by definition has to enter twice even in a given account, and often with multiple accounts, it enters into them as well. But this is the, the nuts and bolts of dealing with what do you mean by income as opposed to a financial transaction and so on. Uh, from these transaction-based uh, surveys, you create those balance sheets and income statements and so on, and from them, you can go all the way to national income. The Bureau of Economic Analysis tells us exactly how to use uh, corporate financial statements and aggregate them up to create the appropriations account, the balance of payments account, production account, and savings account, and I've just illustrated two of them here. Uh, and of course, it's not just about measurement, then you do analysis with these things. You can. Uh, look at the effect of financial deepening and increased trade or 
uh, look at welfare gains and losses. Uh, and the next step, and this is the key to mapping the financial system, are these flow of funds accounts. So the flow of funds basically is something like this. Suppose a household or a firm is running a surplus. Uh, you know, what happens to that money? Well, they could invest it in real capital assets uh, or they can put it in financial assets. So the um, income statement generating the surplus is linked to the change in the balance sheet. Uh, and you can do this as these pictures illustrate for particular objects like doing the transaction in currency or doing in loans or doing in trade credit. You can do it at the village level, measuring surpluses or deficits. And you can do it at the national level, which you're probably more familiar with, where you have the sectors, uh, the rest of the world, the government, households, and non-financial <coughs> corporations, again, measuring deficits and, and surpluses. And you can use these accounts, again, to do analysis. You can look at the impact of monetary economy on villages or look at internal flow of funds. Uh, now, the Thai surveys are fairly high frequency, but we discovered that it's, uh, we've had some doubts about the way we measured the use of cash in transactions, and I'm home in Boston working with the Boston Fed. And they do, in the U.S. system, surveys on payments. So, they will distinguish, for example, whether someone paid, because they ask them, and they ask them to keep diaries, paid for something in cash, or they used a credit card, they used a prepaid or debit card, and so on. And they measure all of it. So with Scott Shu, we teamed up and actually created a new version of the cash flow statement. But it's not just cash. It distinguishes all these high-velocity objects demand deposits, credit cards, and so on. By the way, along, we are also comparing all the leading US surveys in terms of not just the statement of cash flow, but the balance sheet, the statement of income, and so on. And you know, no, no one survey actually covers all these things, partly as an accident of history. They'll have maybe one or two of the uh, accounts, but n not all three. So uh, we didn't, I didn't fill in all the rest of these X's and O's, uh, but we have hopes that we'll maybe uh, provide some impetus to the integration of, uh, of accounts in the U.S. or other countries. Now, the a I want to focus a lot on financial intermediaries. They're actually in the uh, flow of funds accounts. You may remember Tobin and Brainerd, who did uh, some seminal work very early on, uh, before real business cycle modeling, uh, actually looking at the substitutability of uh, various financial assets and trying to back out elasticities, and through that, trying to figure out the impact of, of monetary policy. Maybe not doing it the way we would today, but you know, it's really amazing seminal work with the flow of funds data. Uh, and likewise today, if you wanna know, you know what happened to the unconventional monetary policy, you can actually look and see through the flow of funds accounts who bought what assets the Fed was, was basically, uh, or who sold assets that the, the, the Fed was buying and it's different across the different policies that they've engaged in. Anyway, what's listed there as bank, uh, financial institutions are depository institutions, insurance companies, investment funds, pension and retirement funds, state and local governments, broker dealers, that's kind of interesting. So where's the New York Stock Exchange? It's right there, uh, as well as peer-to-peer -peer platforms I'll talk about. And then oddly, under this category of financial institutions appears households. Well, it, it is odd. And unfortunately, that's where the hedge funds are. Don't ask me what the history is. But hedge funds are coded as households, and they appear, therefore, as if households were doing financial intermediation. 
along with the other things households do. Uh, now, it's not just across sectors, though. It's within sectors. So I'm going to show you three slides. This first one is about transactions in my Thai villages, where we survey. And, uh, and these uh, are various sub-networks within a given village in one of the villages. And in the other one, it's almost true that everyone's connected to everybody else. So these are observed uh, transactions in gifts and, and borrowing and lending. Remember, it all comes from transactions data. Is there Actually, that, that distinguishes between these two villages? Uh, in terms of yeah, the Buriram is a more traditional village out in the northeastern agrarian part of the country, and Chat Trung Sao is relatively near Bangkok, so you might think that uh, these networks deteriorate to some extent with economic development. However, other things rise to take their place. I'll show you a picture momentarily. Uh, this isn't from the Thai villages. This is actually a New York money market. This is the federal funds market. Uh, you can actually see minute by minute who's trading with whom uh, in the federal funds market early on and then midday where it's quite complete and it sort of uh, drags off toward the end. And these guys who wrote this paper Beck and Adelaide have a, have a decomposition with labels uh, about network centrality, which I don't agree with the concept, but it, it is widely used. And, and this is the, the version of what happens in development. So this isn't exactly transaction, but it is a, a conglomerate where basically all these seemingly separate con companies are actually held by the same family. Uh, so, you know, arguably, and Chris showed in his dissertation, they actually seem to, uh, to share a lot of risk together, but I'll come back to that momentarily. Now, we move toward what I dared bring up, Main Street versus Wall Street. So how do we think of that through the lens of these financial accounts? Well, uh, ideally, you would actually measure the transactions with a geographic identifier. But shockingly, it isn't done. Uh, we're trying to make it happen in a project in Thailand. We were part of, through the Gates Foundation, funding a project in Mexico. Uh, I've asked the guys at the Federal Reserve Board if they have the geographic identifiers, or at least publish the geographic accounts, and they don't do it. But you know, it's kind of like, how can you talk about Main Street versus Wall Street if you're not actually seeing the transactions within and across, you know, those, those, there are indirect ways to do it. The feldstein Harioki puzzle is basically, you know, savings and investment turn out to be correlated. It's a puzzle because if the financial system is working well, then, you know, arguably uh, investment should happen regardless of local savings. You would just be borrowing the money from, from somewhere else. Uh, so we do see uh, bits and pieces of it, and you know China looks somewhat fragmented, although less and less over time as that country develops. Germany across regions within Germany, it's quite an integrated economy as you would kind of expect. So these indirect methods are helpful when that's all we have. If you go back, you know Asdrubali and co-authors wrote this paper in 1996, which they called the channels of interstate risk sharing. And this is kind of interesting because it's cross state flows and how much happens due to borrowing and lending, how much happens to, due to capital flows and so on. It would be even more interesting if I showed you what they did state by state uh, because it kind of conjures up the underlying economics of what these states are doing. This seems to have fallen out of fashion, but I would argue, again, that it's things like this that would be uh, very helpful. On the other hand, you look at Maya Eden and her co-authors wrote this paper, it's kind of how I found it, the connection between Wall Street and Main Street in measurement and implications for monetary policy. Now, what they mean by Wall Street is the degree of indirect finance, right? Rather than say a company borrows by issuing a bond, 
and someone buys the bond, you know, what we see more of increasingly is shadow banking and so on, which is sort of intermediary, intermediated through third or, or multiple parties. Now, good or bad, they don't say, but I think that's closer to the stereotypical view of Wall Street, that all these guys are just trading with each other and trying to make money, and it's, it's not real. It's not really helpful to, to the guys on, on Main Street. Um, so this leaves you with the impression that somehow as economies develop, they become more and more concentrated for good or evil in the financial sector. But on the other hand, you start looking at innovations. And, and this slide, which I found recently, uh, features what they call marketplace finance. So these are peer-to-peer -peer or crowdfunding sources. The money is flowing. Uh, it's not trivial anymore from investors, institutions, high net worth individuals, hedge funds actually, to consumers and small businesses and entrepreneurs. And it's flowing through these platforms, whether they're loan products or, or equity finance. Uh, so in this case, these platforms, the companies that created them may be out in San Francisco, but these, these are uh, sort of universal access platforms, um, unlike the things we seem to see going on in New York. Uh, but the main point of all of this is to map the financial system. And there is not a complete map of the financial system for the US or any other country that I know of. And yet the ingredients are there, and people are starting to work on it. The National Academy of Sciences is working on it to some degree, the Federal Reserve Bank uh, with its own data uh, are working on it uh, and, uh, and so on. So, you know, let me summarize this part of the talk. So, it begins with measurement. We need, if we're gonna understand how financial systems work and eventually diagnose them, we need to have the measurement to back this up. It, it is within reach especially now since so many of the transactions are actually electronic anyway. All the security transactions are electronics. The, there's no paper securities anymore, really. They're all depository entries, and, and the trades are recorded, and they're required now as a result of the financial crisis to re, be reported every 15 minutes through something called trace. So the data are, in principle, there for many of these things. Now, looks like you know, a theorist is going on and on about measurement, so I wanna quickly sort of say that uh, theory is actually being used uh, in the financial accounts, um, and in particular, it is general equilibrium theory. Uh, so, if you wanna go back to the roots, here's the famous tableau économique, and you can kind of practice your French uh, if you're close enough to see the slide, you can see the étranger, uh, the foreign sector, and the bank système bancaire, and the banking sector, and so on. And he, you know, this is quite early on, 1758. He's drawing a flow of funds diagram. Uh, but you know, we have our version today from Koopmans, the uh, which I'll come to, the welfare theorem. And over here, you can see, you know, these accounts which. Uh, basically add up in all kinds of ways. You know, the sum, the national income account identities are telling us that things like Keynes without the causality, you know, consumption plus investment and so on, add up to income. But also from a household's point of view, they provide factors of production and, you know, factor income ends up uh, equaling uh, household income, which in turn is income used to buy products. So this is all Val Ross law, it's Say's law, it's Keynes's version. These are all accounting identities and they are used effectively in creating the financial accounts. Uh, but of course, if we're gonna do theory, then we can tar start talking about more about the modeling thing. So, you know, I hail from Minnesota, so this is all about preferences, endowments, and technology in our language. If you want to specify a complete economy, you've got to fill in all those things along with uh, 
a specification of uncertainty or location, uh, indivisibilities, and so on. Uh, so Yoram kind of mentioned this, but uh, I started doing this in villages. Uh, uh, and there's a joke about development economists, which is on the slide. You say, you're going to claim to be a development economist. I'm not sure I would. You have to show a picture of a village. So here you can see <laughs> land, labor, and capital all in one fell swoop on the left-hand side. And I had done some stuff earlier. Now, I think the village thing is a bit misleading. I mean, yeah, I did it, started to do it there because I could measure all these things. I could see, pref well, endowments, technology, and so on. But it, it's my passion and my belief that we don't want to be inventing economies out of thin air. I don't want to do macro or financial policy imagining what's going on, just telling some story. In principle, we ought to be able to measure what's there and build the models based on the underlying measurement. Now, that may require computation for more complicated economies, but the principle, it seems to me, is worth pushing. Um, but, so, you know, I'm not in villages anymore is one way to put this. I'm in a whole, you know, entire national economies. And you can think about people moving about in those economies, trading with each other. You can think about the way they trade with one another, whether they're orally giving orders or commands or using tokens or, uh, or electronic telecommunications. But it's the same fundamental principle that's involved with the modeling. Uh, and you can introduce the financial sector into these general equilibrium models. It's actually pretty straightforward because, for one thing, we've got wealth. Wealth is just the valuation of endowments. So as, as when you have prices and you have you know, endowments or profits, then you have wealth. And, uh, Likewise, you have an indirect utility function as a function of wealth and prices, but that's like a value function. Um, and, uh, and that has a more general interpretation. And you can actually introduce securities into these environments in the obvious way. I mean, Arrow and DeBru were doing it very early on. You want to think of it as abstract and irrelevant, like you know, state contingent claims on apples. But no, because we can introduce money into these economies, especially if it were a village, which is a small open economy, then money is, we, if you give up explaining it, is just a, an object that has value outside the system. But you can also introduce uh, private debt, and you can have private debt that circulates. So we're creating liquidity through privately issued instruments. And, uh, and securitization is a more sophisticated version of that, where you use somebody else's promise to issue your own promise. You can do all of this in the Edgeworth box and, and give it realistic interpretations. Uh, so it's, so the, this, this root, as you will, will, the general equilibrium root. It, now, I do part company. For example, Woodruff writes this paper doing without money, controlling inflation in a postmodern world, uh, that's a bit of a hat trick because he, what, he introduces money as cash in advance for a subset of the goods, and then he's essentially driving that, that fraction of goods to zero. But you do have prices along the way. You don't have them in the limit. And that's Woodford's analysis of monetary economics, which is so influential today. Why do I have trouble with it? Because it's a story about the micro underpinnings, and you just lose connection to the actual devices that create the liquidity and the trades that are accomplished with, with these objects that serve as liquidity. So my preferred version of doing monetary economics, as you'll see, is to actually go back to the micro underpinnings and, and the measurement. And there's some lessons from previous theory that that, that can be used right away. Um, mainly what comes out of this general equilibrium approach 
are the first principles. Pareto optimality, meaning you can't make someone better off without making someone worse off. That's a weak but very important notion of efficiency. And we have these welfare theorems that tell us when a competitive equilibrium will be Pareto optimal and when any Pareto optimal allocation can be supported as a competitive equilibrium. But rather than get religious about it and say these theorems always hold, they don't hold, always. When you have externalities, for example, pollution, uh, or incomplete asset markets with collateral, uh, then you're going to break the gap between the link between competitive equilibria and uh, Pareto optimality. And that's where we begin to think about policy. You know, so for me, the first principle is let's look at a system, could be a trading platform, could be an allocation of risk. Ask yourself, is it Pareto optimal or not through analysis? If not, maybe you'll identify an obstacle that might have a policy remedy. Or otherwise, let's go with ex ante design of the financial system to, to remedy the thing that's causing the problem. So that's kind of the algorithm that comes from general equilibrium modeling. Um, so, so let's use it. And I'll, I'll give you two illustrations. One, let's look at how auctions and markets are organized and see if we can use the principle of Pareto optimality or its cousins like core allocation to determine whether trading rules or financial platforms are good or bad. Now here, I'm falling back on some early work that was done along the way in the creation of general equilibrium model. For example, Wilson had a paper on multi-good auctions called competitive exchange. And there, households submit vectors of trades, uh, several vectors. Uh, and Wilson showed that with a somewhat disinterested third party as an auctioneer, you would achieve a core allocation in the limit as the number of traders get large. That, that's kind of interesting because it worked, but also it tells us something about whether you want to have uh, as in tri-party, have the main play, one of the main players, you know, actually designing and implementing the platform, or you, you want to have some kind of independent third party designing the platform. Uh, or there's this paper by Dubay called Price Quantity Strategic Games, and their traders submit limit orders. So this runs exactly the way the New York Stock Exchange runs today and many other exchanges. But there's a key here, and that's the general equilibrium part of it. Namely, you're trying to get to uh, an efficient allocation. So although traders bid in some unit of account for each of the, of the many securities or commodities that's allowed to be traded, those markets have to be linked in some way. How are they, and Dubay did this by allowing them borrow allowing them to borrow unit of account, and then he has some bankruptcy rule. Of course, the tricky thing there is that it, without the bankruptcy, they would all you know, buy before they sell and never pay back. So there's kind of an intrinsic uh, link that has to do with credit uh, in achieve, you know, when you're doing these uh, limit orders across each market. The Fed doesn't do this particularly well. It looks at each security market one at a time, great micro data to try to figure out how they're operating. But on the other hand, this paper came from the Federal Reserve, and it's a, a picture of the Fed funds, mark, Fed funds wire that is used to pay all these uh, different uh, uh, as the means of payments in these clearinghouses and so on. So. I tried to get this picture for India. They don't have one. I mean, but you really need to understand what the means of payments are and how those things link across all these different security markets. And, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, I did some work on theories of intermediated structures where 
agents call out prices and try to attract trades. I think this is pretty close to what we're seeing going on in China with these business-to-business -business financial platforms. Um, there are some things we learned. Uh, there are two ways to allow the competition. You can have uh, households or businesses participating on multiple platforms uh, and not have exclusivity. Uh, but actually, that can cause a problem. So Peter Crampton has a very interesting paper on uh, high-frequency traders where they're just trying to exploit, you know, in something less than a second, the fact that a posted price is different across different exchanges and investing an enormous amount of money to be able to quickly arbitrage and make, and make profits across those exchanges. So that's a potential problem with allowing uh, multiple participation on exchanges. You could invoke exclusivity, given that trades are monitored anyway, which means that you can only deal with one platform. But there could still be ex-ante competition for the right to provide those services. And that, that works, especially when you have large traders, large number of traders, but it can be a problem if you have large and, and a small number of traders. So I could go on. And, and there, you know, there's things that didn't work so well. For example, an early paper, not so early paper on whether you want to have the competition to attract funds before you have competition for lending or vice versa. One of those things works well, and the other is terrible. Terrible buy. This standard I keep using, the same standard, achieving Pareto optimal or core allocations. So this, is, this work is giving us some guidance about potential problems and how to organize these financial markets and, and other work on double auctions, which I'll skip. Um, so here's another example of this algorithm something I've done quite a bit, which is the allocation of risk bearing. So you can maximize the weighted sum of utilities of households and derive pretty quickly something called the risk sharing rule. Uh, and there are two parts of it. One, idiosyncratic shocks should be shared. In fact, if they are shared optimally, they completely dissip dissipate. No one should be bearing idiosyncratic risk in this world before I get to moral hazard and, and other obstacles to trade. There's another piece that's just as interesting. What about the aggregate shocks? By definition, they cannot be pooled away. Someone has to bear them. But they should be borne in proportion to their risk tolerance. And that's how you design and think about ex ante uh, the design of risk-bearing systems. Are we doing this a lot? No, actually, mostly it's ex post. You know, some big shock happens and it's, oh my God, people are interconnected with each other. This is contagion. You know, we need to build firewalls. It's a very, very different language, a very different policy perspective. Just shift gears and take the ex-ante perspective. Acknowledge some shocks, like aggregate shocks, are going to happen and design the system optimally, ex ante, with commitment, if you can, to uh, figure out how those shocks are going to be born. So financial crisis in this way of looking at it are not special events. They don't deserve special consideration. They're associated with large aggregate shocks, but we should design the financial system and commit to it to uh, to have this ex ante action plan rather than some ex post rationalization of, of intervention. Uh, so what goes on in villages? Well, some villages are amazingly good at achieving this optimal allocation. If you were thinking just now, this is some fantasy, this is my reality. These are villages in India where you can see how income does not co-move. There's a lot of idiosyncratic risk in this sort of rocky mountain picture. But on the other hand, Kansas over there, that's the consumption picture. You know, so they have ways of moving from all that idiosyncratic risk, mediating it 
in ways that I'll tell you to, to smooth consumption. Um, and that's kind of the planning problem, risk sharing. This is the Edgeworth box that I'm often stuck in. Uh, this is right out of Moscow, Winston, and Green, and it just tells you, you know, the dimension of the box determines the aggregate shock, and it tells you how competitive markets would work to price those risks uh, depending on whether or not there's agreement on preference, uh, agreements about the probabilities of states of the world and so on. So we know how to decentralize these worlds too. Um, and we know how to generalize this stuff. It's really not about Edgeworth boxes. It allows production, labor supply, and so on. And of course, it aggregates up from villages, as I've been trying to say. You can look at risk sharing across counties, uh, as this picture tries to do. And we can see how they're actually doing it. Back home in the villages, so to speak, they're actually doing it with gifts and borrowing. The main thing is cash, self-insurance, but active financial networks, uh, self-help, not self-help, uh, community help networks are a main thing in Thailand. That other picture came from India, and there it's more self-insurance, uh, at least that picture. There are two lines, they're right on top of each other, which means essentially every time they run a deficit, they draw down their stocks of grain, and every time they run a surplus, they put the grain back in the, in the storage bin. And it's almost perfect. I mean, you, if you had a model simulation, no one would believe you. This is the reality that you actually see on the ground. So these sort of indigenous systems uh, are different in different places, but they have their ways of coping with, with the shocks. Um, this picture, which I had on the screen, almost like a screensaver, is, uh, is a picture of Thai financial networks with these households, again, linked to each other and linked to outside lenders. Um, and that's a very big part of how the villages do it. Now, how do we do it in New York? Oh, well, we have things like uh, portfolios of stocks, indexed funds, uh, more interesting examples have to do with central counterparty clearing, which is a mutualization of losses that might happen depending on what a trader does. These are all instances of ex ante to design to achieve an optimal allocation of risk bearing. Uh, you can actually index it by the weather. If you want to know which hurricane is going to strike Florida, uh, you know, there are simulated paths and they actually write financial contracts indexed on, on these paths and, and people are buying and selling. Schiller stuff is well known. The Case-Shiller index is a way to track housing prices so people could potentially uh, minimize their exposure to the thing that's probably the largest in their portfolio, either as a debt or, or as an asset. I, I like to draw the link Back to Ben Franklin, he introduced in Philadelphia these mutual insurance societies, and they're very much like, you know, Thai households sharing risk formally through an institution. By the way, you weren't allowed to plant trees on your yard because that's kind of a moral hazard problem that would create more fires and the fire company wouldn't, wouldn't get there in time and there would be a loss and it was a mutual scheme. So. We still have mutual insurance societies in the U.S. as well. Now, blending those two things back to the villages, we can apply this fancy capital asset pricing model, which tells you something like uh, the risk is the market risk. The, that's the risk you can't undo, that you're exposed to it. And if you're going to be exposed, you need to be compensated. So the expected return ought to be higher for projects that have a lot of village level covariate risk. And this picture is from Thailand telling you that's exactly what's going on, basically. Uh, there's a high correlation between the rate of return on assets, uh, the covariance of the rate of return on assets, and uh, via this beta, and the mean return on assets. So it's a risk 
<coughs> a risk award uh, compensation schedule. And, and they're doing it a in large part by ensuring away the idiosyncratic risk, just like the, the, the uh, theories that I mentioned earlier. So if I've confused you, I apologize. But my point here is we're using a common framework. Villages are not special. We can talk about the allocation of risk. We can talk about decentralization as in competitive markets. Those theories apply to villages, yes. They also apply to the US and other advanced, seemingly advanced uh, financially developed countries. Um, and new products appear even now. So for example, you can buy insurance on a financial platform, although I don't think they went and surveyed the households to see if they really need it. And that's, again, targeting small guys on Main Street, <clears throat> so to speak. Um, but uh, there can be problems in creating these indexed funds. And I think for one of time, I will just uh, uh, have to skip over this. Um, Suffice it to say, not, a, not everyone is an obvious winner. If markets are incomplete and you introduce an indexed fund, someone may be a loser, namely those people who had been providing insurance at the local level to their village peers may now take a loss in consumption because that insurance isn't needed when you introduce this outside product. So there are policy lessons coming from, from this work. Um, so I mentioned, you know, and I don't want to leave you with the impression that this is all about full risk sharing with no obstacles. <clears throat> this algorithm works when we start introducing things like limited information, moral hazard, and actually it has some interesting surprises, both for the institutions you would expect to see and for the allocations. So let me deal with the institutions first. When there's private information and people might want to announce or reveal or make claims about their underlying situation, that's going to make for long-term relationships. Now, banks actually do this. There is a literature, uh, Loretta Mester and others, uh, that show banks that have a fairly reliant deposit base can be more generous with their long-term uh, borrowers. And it could look bad. It could look like they're taking a loss and forgiving interest or something when the borrower isn't doing very well. But actually, that's exactly what the theory says they ought to be doing. The quid pro quo is when the borrower does well, they're effectively going to be paying back higher than market interest rate. There seems to be hints that that's what's going on in New York with these broker-dealers as well, that long-term relationship. The traders complain they're getting screwed by the, those dealers, but they keep going back to those same dealers over and over again. So I think this relationship-based trading is a big part of the financial system and not necessarily a bad thing. This push to move all the trades onto these big anonymous platforms, that may not be necessarily the right way to go. Um, concealment, almost deliberately trying to make it look bad. And in fact, dark pools kinds of conjures up evil stuff, you know, that, that mitigates price discovery and so on. But no, the theory tells us that it actually could be a very good thing. And you don't want to have something like a credit registry that is revealing everything to everybody. That is not what mechanism design tells you. That's not going to come from the revelation principle as, a, as an optimal allocation. You actually want a disinterested computer or mechanism designer to be scrambling, deliberately randomizing the allocations in order to prevent uh, information from leaking which would be ex post, something somebody might like, but ex ante is a, is a bad thing. And I think that's what's going on with those dark pools, um, which are very prevalent these days. And finally, delegation, where people create exchange-traded funds or use wealth managers. It all seems very strange until you 
sort of take this theoretical perspective where you realize that delegation to uh, third parties is actually part of the part of the optimal design. Now, I'm not saying that any weird thing you're going to find in practice is necessarily optimal, but I am saying that you know it's it's reinforcing when you use the theory and go look, you can reinterpret these institutions uh, that some people scowl about as potentially uh, beneficial and not something you want to do away with. <clears throat> now, you can also look at allocations uh, like we did with the risk sharing. Uh, you have an entrepreneur running a business, borrowing capital, implementing effort, getting random output, and so on. <clears throat> and a model, take a stand on preferences, endowments, and technology, uh, a calibrated you know, structural model will give you implications for the observables, consumption, and so on. And you can actually back out uh, what financial regime fits the data best and, and what the underlying obstacles are. Um, so for example, in my Thai data, there's a period where they introduced these million baht funds, which was an outside intervention by the government. And uh, lots of things happened. And through the lens of costly state verification, we are beginning to understand that uh, somehow the village fund was like a catalyst that allowed them to take advantage, not eliminate, but rather take advantage of the, uh, of the, of the financial network that was already there. And, and again, least you think this is all about villages, you can take the same thing to Spain, where they have all the data from the financial system. You can see all the transactions uh, with banks. And then we found this sort of segment of firms which look unbanked, like, you know, the unbanked is like the undead, terrible, terrible curse. But actually, they do better than anybody else. It's like, well, how can it be the case that firms that aren't borrowing from banks are doing better than the ones that do? And the answer turns out to be it's a, it's a family network. You know, we tediously trace back the, uh, the owners of the firms, and we can um, have a, a more understandable story about what's going on uh, that allows them to do, to do better. Than the, un, than the firms that are banked. Uh, okay, so let me say about uh, competitive markets, you can decentralize these <coughs> environments with private information, and uh, uh, you just got to get the institutions right. So basically, the key here is to have broker-dealers. Now, to me, the broker-dealers that emerge in the stuff I did with Ed Prescott several years ago are like the financial platforms that I was alluding to, those marketplace platforms. What is a broker-dealer doing? It's basically intermediating. Um, uh, so, for example, take retirement funds with options, you know, so when you can't, you can, you can take your TIA uh, or Kraft account and uh, cash it out and take part of it lump sum, or you can leave it in there. And uh, sure enough, the people that cash it out and take the lump sum turn out to be pe the people who die early. So they kind of know something that uh, <clears throat> made it more advantageous than, than keeping the money in there and taking this lifelong pension. But think about it as an option. That, that is a contract that's effected with the decision of the, of the investor. Uh, so it's like a security contract with options that are in, executed by, by the investors. And, and what are the broker-dealers doing? Well, in this case, insurance companies have entered into contracts with all these different people. And they're pooling all that risk. They're just saying, oh, here's the fraction of the population. They're going to take the lump sum. There's another fraction that won't take it. 
let's make sure we at least break even on average. So they're not really creating something new, they're just pooling all that risk. Likewise, you have security transformation over time. That's what intermediary is doing. And these banks emerge right out of uh, general equilibrium with, with private information. Um, now, it sounds like um, maybe a Chicago economist pushing uh, free markets everywhere. I, I hope that as much as I love Chicago, it's, there's a little bit more to it than, than just being an advocate for laissez-faire. Uh, I'm deriving the opti optimal institutions. I've actually been telling you certain institutions are not desirable. And likewise, on these competitive markets, you need to restrict some kind of trade. So oddly, allowing the households to deal directly with one another can potentially be a bad thing because it can undercut the incentives that the financial institutions need, uh, incentives for businesses to be diligent and take appropriate action and, and so on. These are well-known problems in theory. Jacqueline told us about this many, many years ago. But it does provide guidance. I mean, there's this big push, for example, a modern country is supposed to have a stock market, so investors should be able to buy directly from, uh, invest directly in firms. Not necessarily. Some of these models tell us that's not the way to do it, that investors should deal with banks, and banks should be the one doing the investments. Yes, question. No, that's why I introduce all these obstacles. So, I mean, uh, these, you could have unobserved preference shocks, you could have labor supply that's contingent on your underlying household uh, situation, you can have households running firms which are subject to moral hazard. So the contract that emerges from all of that is not full insurance. It's actually incentive contracts. The firm has an incentive to take effort. They're going to actually have more take-home pay when they have positive profits than they will when they have negative profits and so on. What I mean is it might be a transmission uh, mechanism that a small risk would bring to certain uh, output, but a bigger risk is bring to something which is totally different. Can you follow my uh, line of thought? Well, to me, those big shocks are like macro aggregate shocks, but, but then we should take a stand on how to deal with that aggregate risk. That's what I was saying earlier. You have to embed that with these information and moral hazard considerations to design the optimal degree of indexation against the aggregate shocks, but you should definitely have some part of your contract that is indexed by those aggregate shocks. Whereas this thing like oh, it's a big bad shock, everyone's now connected, there's going to be, it's systemic, you know, I have no idea what that language means. It's systemic is just like micro, you know, prudential, or macro prudential, I don't know what that means. That, that's called, that's all the language of ex post, there's a bad shock, we got to deal with it now, rather than the ex ante language of let's, let's think about the contracts, let's think about the markets, let's think about the regulation and maybe even the degree of commitment on the part of policymakers so people internalize and have the, the right ex-ante incentives. Okay, so um, uh, I say something at the end about whether you should have single platforms or multiple platforms, but uh, you know, I'm gonna skip it with the hope that I might even get some questions. More questions, which I like. 
uh, and, uh, and end with uh, one minute on payments, which I've been alluding to all along. Uh, so this is a picture of cash management in Thailand. Uh, this is one household from many where you can see the inflows and outflows of cash as a consequence of running the business. You can see they actually on average hold quite a bit of cash, uh, which is something of an anomaly in the sense that it's hard to get a model to deal with it. But I don't want to end there. What I want to say is if you think about alternatives to holding cash, maybe they should have deposits or have that money in the banking system. So Kenya invented cell phone money, and pesa which is an electronic currency. So you take your money to an agent or a dealer for Safaricom and do this value exchange of the Kenyan shillings for, for the electronic currency, which you have on your phone. And then I can remit it to my mom back home or you know, pay for uh, goods at a store and so on. Uh, the key is cash out. It's not just cash in. Uh, you have to be able to, they want it to be cashed out. So these agents are actually solving a pretty complicated problem. They have a double inventory problem. They have to have the right balances of the cash and also the right balances of e-money because under the rules they're not allowed to create, you know, net supply of, of the e-money. E-money only gets created from the accounts, yes? How many of those agents went back? Well, yes and no. So you're anticipating they're running out of stuff all the time. All the time. Customer shows up, I want e-money uh, for this cash. The agent doesn't have enough cell phone credit. Or the more obvious, I guess obvious, which is somebody wants to withdraw the cash. And, uh, and so, but, but that's not the end of the story. They start borrowing from each other. These agents give gifts and borrow from, from these things called aggregators or super agents or even just from each other. So it's not terribly well documented, but there's an informal money market going on. And that's mitigating you know, this bankruptcy risk. Now you say, oh, this is all about villages. Well, hopefully you've got the point. The basic model here is there's a lot of uncertainty and no payment system is immune from, from this problem. And so you go to the U.S. and start looking. And not only is it true in 9-11 that these um, value of payments shrink then and also in the financial crisis, more shockingly, if you start looking at settlement failures in U.S. treasuries, there's a lot of trades that actually fail because the buyer doesn't come up with the liquidity at the end of the day. There's more liquidity outstanding in these intraday loans than there is in the excess reserves that have been created from the unconventional monetary policy. So this is the, the nuts and bolts plumbing. Now obviously, you know, rather than relish having a problem, the real issue here is how to solve it and I'm maintaining, as I have throughout the talk, that if you go back to first principles and start looking at our earlier monetary models, Ostroy, Star, Schubik, and so on, you can see through the lens of those theoretical models why these problems might arise. And you can also get a sense of potential remedies from that, from that same literature. So in my mind, this is the way to think about the, the optimal design of uh, of payment systems. So in conclusion, I hope I've at least given you a flavor of how to think about policy and how to think about financial markets based on first principles. Familiar general equilibrium first principles. It's a very operational algorithm. It tells you how to think about institutions, how to evaluate them, how to form judgments if you have the data based on underlying allocation. It accommodates information, limited commitment, and other obstacles. And, uh, and ideally should, should tell us something about ex ante optimal design. Now, it's ambitious, yes, that's true. 
it's very hard not in a given country to fall back on things like, well, it's always been this way, so that's kind of not. Meanwhile, we keep having all these problems. So I'm an advocate for taking a cold, hard look through the data and the models to see what would be an optimal design and then you know, to mitigate fire sales or whatever, try to move in, in that direction that, that rather than leave all these unspecified risks that could cause the next crisis and some ad hoc policy response. So thanks for bearing with me. Yes, please. My name is Lauren. I'm a graduate from here, from CN Economics. So I, uh, I've been hearing the news uh, generally, not always, but uh, I had a uh, general uh, rumoring that uh, first, uh, firstly, that, uh, ne ben that a lot of uh, small businesses, uh, they become uh, bankrupt. And uh, I read in the newspaper and the, uh, the internet, I read in the, the, the Facebook, the article, they said by uh, the next uh, year, the 2016, they suspect that a lot of uh, businesses, big firm, will become uh, insolvency, insolvent. And they see like, like, a, like I need to furnish a flat or like this. Here in Israel or? Yeah, in, in Israel, in Israel. So I, I'm checking because I'm, I'm remembering uh, what is an uh, interesting lecture about checking the data. So I know a lot of like, because I need to furnish a, a flat. So a lot of, there were a lot of sales, you know, they give it get credit, like 12 percent, 12 installment without interest for, for electrical appliances, for furnishing, for kitchen, everything, because they, they become insolvent. So because in the, in the, they, they call it uh, big uh, malls and the, uh, and the uh, people that don't have, you know, I'm sure you checked about Israel, you're familiar with the Israeli data, because they're going to raise in process within two years the the small uh, families the 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 basic units of economics uh, basic salary 90 percent of the people uh, they earn a minimum wage they're going to raise it uh, to higher it compared to the eu or it, the the wage is is relatively uh, lower yeah what you say so they're going to be, so therefore the demand the actual demand is very low. So then, therefore, the what, what from my ear that uh, and from I know living most of my ear, in my life here that the basic economic uh, insolvency is in very high level. So I think uh, also I don't I'm not sure that uh, the problem is because uh, bearing in mind what uh, your interesting lecture was that we have the oligopolies, small families. But some of the holding families are holding also the bank. Is it, is it true? The, the same holdings of the oligopoly family is the holding the bank. So it's not like a, a it's not like a in your model that bank so a, well, let, so let me change in families because the same families holding the banks are also okay, a, many, many. A, a real a, a real yeah, holdings. So I think this is the I, problem. So well, I can respond to that. The, First of all, the, nothing I said prevent I'm actually advocating a kind of monitoring system. When you create these uh, financial accounts and you have a map of the financial system, you would actually know what contracts and arrangements these entities, whether they're banks or families or firms, have entered into. So that's part of it. You could think of it as a monitoring system. Now, to the extent that uh, someone discounted the risk, uh, then that's kind of a a bad, potentially bad contract. I mean, there's room for differences of opinion, but, but then those people should take losses when these, when these companies go bad. In terms of how to handle this kind of risk, it's not that hard to do. You create basically, um, I mean, it sounds fancy, but credit default swaps are exactly this. You have a borrowing company, you have an investor, the investor is worried that the borrower will not be able to pay. They basically, the investor buys insurance for a premium so that they can get indemnified if it were to happen that the borrowing company goes bankrupt. And, and in New York and other countries, you see a very, very active market in credit default swaps, and you can even create in, indexed uh, funds that, uh, although not based one at a time on individual issuers do capture what's going on in a whole market segment. So 
I'm into analysis. I'm not into sort of saying that everything's perfect. I, you know, it, it's Thailand. They worry a lot about consumer debt. It just happens that they're getting it wrong always. But that's a different story. They don't. They, you know, they don't actually have the data I have on consumer indebtedness, which, which overall is quite low. So, do the monitoring, do the mapping, know what the facts are, understand the contracts, and then look at the way the system is currently designed to handle the risk. Let's take, let's, let's take some other questions here. There's still time. Yeah, so I didn't tell you enough about the cost side. It's true that not everyone is connected to everyone else. You can think about models with transactions costs, which are like a shortcut for something we don't understand deeply. It could be you have a, a fairly large lender type player who's going to be the central node and everyone's dealing with that in informal lender. That's, that's another sort of star network. Uh, so we have more work to do. We're not done yet sort of figuring out all these networks. But uh, uh, you need costs. You need something to limit the network size. Otherwise, everyone should be, should be in a network. Um, I also asked a question. Any, we talked a little bit about lunch, but any thoughts about what might happen with these uh, networks? <laughs> Right, so, you know, so, so these sort of first principles <coughs> models uh, from theory illustrate or pinpoint the importance of liquidity, but not necessarily outside, you know, central bank liquidity. Uh, let's see if I have, no, wait. Um, I'm looking for the one that's, oh, yeah, I see, I didn't put his name. Mashish Goyal at Stanford has, has done this thing on systems mediated by trust. So there the idea is, uh, you know, there's a common person that we trust. I don't trust you, but, you know, we both know Donnie and, and you know, sort of we work through him. And that allows trade to be happening among relative strangers. And Ripple, which is a competitor to Bitcoin, basically works on that trust system. So it's all internal, inside stuff. As you might say the trust is private credit uh, that's kind of mediating the system. Now, it's not a perfect substitute for fiat money. You know, you could, they, uh, Galial does this comparison of two otherwise equivalent systems, one where the trust is replaced by an equivalent value of fiat money, and the, and the latter works better. So it's not, it's not a complete panacea. So yeah, you know from our lunch conversation, I'm, I guess I'm worried. What's driving my interest is not just the theory. It's my worry that when the Federal Reserve, you know, and the US sort of implicitly underwrites all these trades, that it's creating another moral hazard problem. You know, I, I think it's not an accident that so many of these trades in treasuries, which is a safe security, are failing at the end of the day because basically someone bought something with money they don't have. They ran short of liquidity and they anticipated future deals. They weren't necessarily gaming the system, although there is a lot of strategic behavior going on at the end of the day. And what I'm really worried about is you know, you have some event, some episode, they would call it, uh, and the Federal Reserve will just jump in and provide the liquidity. I mean, yeah, they did it in 9-11. I understand why. 
they, you know, when you had the run on repo and all these things in the financial crisis, then again, the Fed intervened, and I kind of understand why. But the plea of the talk is to move toward a system where we're kind of taking these things into account in a more systematic way, and, and we're not underwriting or creating risk by some seemingly well-intended policy.